we are counting down our complete ranking of the MCU movies. This is something that the audience voted on, the Den of Geek staff voted on. It's an aggregate of everything. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Marvel Standom. And this week, it is the end game to last week's Infinity War. That's right, folks. We are counting down the top 10 of the 27 MCU movies so far. Right here, coming to you, presented by the folks at Den of Geek. And as you see, we got from 27 with Thor The Dark World up to number 11 with Spider-Man No Way This Movie Should Have Ranked This High. <laughs> and uh, this week, we're going to hit the top 10. But before we get into that, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Plex, because Plex is the, car- is the sponsor of this particular episode, and they are the current streaming home of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. You can watch Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man trilogy for free, presented by Crackle on Plex. This limited time engagement ends on March 1st, so you better act fast. Plus, Plex also has over 50,000 free on-demand titles and over 200 live TV channels. So download the Plex app today, free on all your favorite devices to start watching. So we are going to get to that top 10 and we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it pretty quickly, but there's a couple of developments on denigeek.com that you should know about. First of all, in case you missed the episode we did about the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy that is archived on YouTube, go check that out. We also have an article about the best moments in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy presented by our folks at Plex. It's over on denigeek.com slash Marvel. That is also where you can find all of our coverage of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which dropped a completely bonkers trailer during the Super Bowl on Sunday night. So we didn't have time to do uh, you know, traditionally we would do a breakdown uh, episode for that, but because we're doing the rankings this week. We didn't have time to do it. So you want to see my thoughts on this, Kirsty's thoughts, uh, great Den of Geek contributors like Gavin Jasper and Jim Dandino, head over to denofgeek.com slash Marvel and check it out. So what do you think, folks? Anything else you want to hit before we start uh, hitting the top 10? I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, yeah let's do it. <laughs> well, I, I do feel vindicated by that Multiverse of Madness trailer, though. <laughs> Yes, uh, any uh, longtime watchers and listeners of Marvel Standom know that Alec is like the passionate Doctor Strange defender here. Uh, and I've been the one who has been kind of throwing, throwing a little shade at the Sorcerer Supreme. This trailer proved me wrong. So uh, I know Alec and Kirsty are feasting on this. It's Katie and I who, uh, <laughs> who are the skeptics. So I'm open. I'm open to being surprised. So. Yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, and let us know, folks, if there's anything in particular you want us to discuss about Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness in future episodes, because May seems like a long time away right now. Get at us on Twitter, and we'll see if we can put together an episode for you, or at least answer some of your questions on a future episode of Marvel Standom. But let's get down to ranking, folks. Here we are with number 10 on our comprehensive Marvel Cinematic Universe ranking. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Great to see a newer Marvel movie ranking this high on here. Um, I was pretty blown away when I saw this for the first time. Never expected a character like Shang-Chi to get a movie like this. I thought it was pretty masterful. Great, great to see it here in the top 10. What does everybody else think? I ranked this movie even higher. I loved this movie. I had so much fun 
seeing it the first time in theaters. Um, the fight choreography excited me in a way that MCU fight choreography hasn't excited me in a while. I loved Tony Lung. I thought he brought such um, weight to the world and to the conflict. So yeah, I'm glad this is in the top 10. I ranked it higher, but I am happy to see it um, this high in general. I think my my need, since it's so relatively recent, my knee jerk reaction upon hearing, you know, Shang Chi is a top ten Marvel movie is confusion. Like what? <laughs> but then when you actually kind of go through and make your ballot and move things around, top ten is entirely appropriate for this. Um, I like that it feels like a kind of a new beginning. Uh, I mean, well, it's we know it's coming up later on the list, but Iron Man's one of my favorite Marvel movies, um, just because of how unabashedly it feels like it's the beginning of something. Um, and Shang-Chi, despite coming this late into the MCU, really feels like a fresh start. And it's just really fun. And like you said, Katie, Tony Long is an incredible villain in that. Um, I mean, really, the, the only major ding against it is the kind of the by the numbers um, ending battle scene. But up to that point- But there point, was a dragon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even, and even then you get a dragon out. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, like... yeah. I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's fun. Top 10 is looks good on Shang-Chi, I think. Yeah, I, I couldn't be on the episode of Marvel Standom where we discussed Shang-Chi when it was released. So I don't think I've shared any thoughts on it here until now. I do exclusive. very much like it. It's, it's my exclusive <laughs> opinion, guys. Um, I do very much like it. I think it's a solid origin story that manages to be a cut above the rest in many ways. Like Katie said, the fight choreography is excellent. Simu and Aquafina are great as Shang-Chi and Katie and Tony Lung, you know, what can you even say? He's the absolute go anyway. I'm not sure he knows how to give a bad performance and Wenwu is a great villain. Tony does um, a really good job of portraying how um, Wenwu's hope of seeing his wife again is worth destroying everything else to achieve. Like you really feel for him. And I think that a lot of people can relate to going on that journey with one of their parents or elders if they've begun clinging to a misguided idea of something, if you know what I mean. Um, my only real gripe with Shang-Chi is that as much as I love Trevor Slattery and find him hilarious, I do find Ben Kingsley's entrance and continuing presence in the movie to be a little bit distracting. There just isn't one moment with Trevor that I wouldn't rather spend with the other characters. I think that's all fair. Uh, I really didn't quite know what to expect either. You know, Flaccid House mentions that uh, this was not a character he'd ever read much of, and that's, you know, fair enough. I I've tried to read some of the old Shang-Chi comics, and they really didn't come together for me. There is a current series, though, uh, written by Gene Yang, which is amazing, which is really, really great and very much in line with the kind of stuff that uh, that you get in the movies right now. So even if you've never read a Shang-Chi comic before, the current Shang-Chi series is like a really good place to start. But I went into this pretty blind too. And for me, one of the, uh, you know, the difference between a good action scene is a, and a great action scene is if I kind of start involuntarily laughing because I'm having such a good time or because things are so wild, you know, like it's not that I'm laughing because it's funny. It's just because like I, it gets me in a very particular way. The bus scene did that and the fight with like the ninjas on the side of the building did that where I was just like, I haven't seen Marvel even attempt stuff like this in so long and it was really great to see. So um, glad to see Shang-Chi making a good showing. All of these characters feel like they're gonna be really important to the future of the MCU. And I think this is gonna be like, you know, uh, I think this is a very interesting new area for them to explore and I can't wait to spend more time with them. There should be um, more. I have one more point on Shang-Chi. You know, like we <laughs> talk about, we've talked about the movie a lot. And I feel like one thing we haven't mentioned uh, as much, one of the coolest things in Shang-Chi are the 10 rings. It's such like a fascinating relic and weapon in the MCU. Like when Wenwu straight up kills a guy just through like the force of like a 10 rings punch, when he and uh, Shang-Chi have their battle and the rings twist around. Um, and then they play a big role in what is a truly awesome post credit scene. So I feel like we just need to pay proper respect to the Ten Rings themselves. Okay. And they're so cool that they're actually being introduced in the comics now, too. Nice. Yeah. Oh, they weren't a part of the comics? Hmm. Oh. Okay. No, it, they, they, I, you know, 
if we if we can digress for a moment and talk about you know the previous mandarin teases in the mcu i know i see everybody rolling their eyes at me but you gotta <laughs> let me have this folks like everybody from the first iron man movie assumed that the 10 rings meant the 10 rings that the mandarin wears on his fingers you know which you know of course we, we kind of got away from that version of the character and and rightfully so so these 10 rings as these weird cosmically powered bracelets or whatever was something very new for the movie. And now they're, they're just starting to get introduced into the newest issues of the Shang-Chi comics. So I'm real curious to see where they go with that. Well, if you were allowed to do that, am I allowed to bring up my <laughs> quasi theory on the rings? Yes. Marvel Standom is out yes, of control. <laughs> we're already, yeah, it's chaos already. Okay. So this makes absolutely no sense, but to me, it feels like there are 10 Eternals and 10 rings and they make the Unimind, uh, the, the bracelets, right? That's it, that's all I've got. I just, I feel like- It's not bad. <laughs> I can get behind that. <laughs> I'll definitely do some work on it. Not so much a <laughs> theory as, as it is an observation, but well observed. Yeah, I, all right, <laughs> like, you know. More it's of a comment than a question. <laughs> <laughs> is it time to move on to number nine? Wait, I, no, I don't. No, I keep going. <laughs> what do you got? Katie? I could keep talking about this movie, but well. I was just giving you a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go with number nine. And it's the Avengers, the original Avengers, folks, the original billion dollar baby, the movie that nobody thought would ever be done, and yet they pulled it off. This is the movie that basically made the MCU as we know it. It's the thing that fulfilled all of the promise of the first movies. And the fact that it was not only not a mess in the first place, but then was this in just totally wild box office success set up everything to follow. And uh, I remember seeing this at a midnight screening and it was like a last minute thing. A, a guy that I knew just called me up. He's like, hey, I, I have a... I have a ticket to Avengers tonight. Do you want to go? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? And, you know, we had a couple beers before the show and, and I went in there and I remember just sitting there going, okay, this is probably going to be a disaster. Like there's just no way they're going to be able to pull all this stuff together properly. And at no point did it ever let me down. And it was a packed house and the audience was absolutely wild. And this felt more like an audience of, you know, people that probably only knew these characters from the movies and not from the comics. And that was when I knew that the MCU was here to stay. Um, what does everybody else think? This movie has no right being as good as it is, considering it has so many characters to juggle. Um, and I actually did rank this movie lower because I think I tend to like the team up movies less just because I feel like we don't have as much time with the characters because there's so many of them. Um, but yeah, I think this movie did exactly what it needed to do. Um, and let us see, you know, some of those dynamics between these characters, um, who at that point too, were in movies that were not necessarily obviously like tonally overlapping. Like I think especially of, you know, Captain America, which was like very much a period film versus Iron Man. Um, and and yeah, and Thor, which <laughs> has its own has its own tone and aesthetic as well. So to see that those movies can exist in the same story or those characters and worlds can exist in the same story was hugely important. And yeah, this is this is a fun movie. It's not one of my favorites, but I I remember being very impressed that that Marvel managed to pull it off. Uh, yeah, this movie rules. Um... I can't remember where I ranked this in my rankings, but nine does seem kind of a touch low. I'm seeing some commenters um, point that out. I will say uh, some man behind the curtain stats. Um, when we were doing all the voting, I was tracking votes as they came in and tallying them up as we went along. I would say for about like the first half of um, voting uh, in this, this contest, Avengers was number one or two for like the first round of voting. And then just some ladder ballots came in that really did not like the Avengers, I guess, and got this bumped down. Um, but this movie is, you're absolutely right. It's way better than it has any right to be. Uh, Mike, you talk about clapping during action scenes. I feel like the Avengers has quite a few of those moments for me. Uh, I think this, maybe my favorite thing about the movie is uh, the Hulk. Um, this feels more like the Hulk origin story 
even though it's not an actual origin story than the Incredible Hulk. Uh, the movie like has to take on an extra level of difficulty in incorporating a new actor as an existing character and kind of doing an origin story, but not really. And within moments, I just totally buy the whole thing. He's awesome. He just gets angry and, you know, hits people. <laughs> it culminates in one of the best uh, physical gags in the history of the MCU, which is when he tosses Tom Hiddleston around like a rag doll. Uh, fantastic movie. I think it's top 10 for sure. I might have gotten you a little higher. I think um, to a lesser extent, this movie does a good job of int reintroducing Natasha as well. As someone who didn't read the comics and know her character, I wasn't really sure who she was by the end of Iron Man 2 or um, didn't necessarily care about her that much. So to get her kind of like reintroduced in this movie um, to me and to other viewers, I think, yeah, was nice, especially for a character that has, yeah, had her ups and downs in the MCU. Um, yeah, that is something that stands out to me about the Avengers. I um I couldn't see Avengers on its opening weekend, but I remember I checked to see what the opening night numbers were like. I think at that point I was still in the first like bloom of love with the MCU and I really didn't want it to fail. So I was nervous about Marvel pulling off like this team up movie. Like super nervous. Um of course I could have just had an early night because I didn't need to be concerned about <laughs> Avengers making any money. Like it made so much money. Um, as the years have gone by, I think it's harder to look at the Avengers and not just see Joss Whedon in it. There's a lot of Whedon in this movie. Um, and the later Avengers films do look a bit better in comparison now, I think. Um, however, when you see this in the top 10 here, it's clear that a lot of people haven't forgotten their first time seeing all these characters together on screen and what a joy that was. Um, Tom Hiddleston is also very much the MVP here, making Loki a force to be reckoned with. And of course, our love affair with Loki is ongoing 10 years later. So he's outlasted a lot of the stars of this film. <laughs> I always wondered why the other Avengers weren't more annoyed with Thor, because like in the films leading up to this, everybody took care of their villain. Like Red Skull, it's gone. <laughs> Abomination, <Yes. laughs> gone. Like... Uh, Jeff Bridges gone, but for some reason they're just like totally fine with it. Thor didn't take care of business, and now it's everybody's problem. And I don't even think anybody expected, even with the Thanos tease at the end of this, you know. And it's like, oh wow, so they're they're going to do that eventually, huh? You know, I never truly thought that the scale of these Avengers movies would grow beyond the Battle of New York. You know, at the time, and this feels like ancient history now, this movie's going to be 10 this summer, right? It's been 10 years since this movie. And at the time, I was still just kind of thinking in terms of what superhero movies had done before cinematically, right? And the Battle of New York was something that was executed in ways that we never would have expected before. But I still figured that future MCU entries would have to be kind of on that scale. And it's like, okay, they're going to do the Infinity Gauntlet, but it's kind of going to be like, you know, what you can do on a movie version of the Infinity Gauntlet. Not quite realizing that they had much broader ambitions, ambitions than that. So yeah, look, Avengers, I feel, sometimes gets a little bit eclipsed by the films that came after it. But when you see the love that the audience put into the vote for it, and you see where this landed on everybody's ballots, I think putting it at number nine is uh, a pretty reasonable, reasonable spot. I do hear the arguments that it's too low, um, you know, but I get it. And I, I don't think we should, uh, I don't think we should ignore it in favor of its flashier sequels, you know? Yeah, it was very cool to see Hawkeye revisit the Battle of New York and add another layer to that um, and create even more of a, yeah, a weight for that battle in showing us how Kate Bishop was connected to it and just like how how people who weren't the Avengers experienced that that world changing event. Um, you know, obviously this movie was world changing in some way for movie blockbusters and for the MCU certainly. But um to give I don't know, like to give weight to this event within the world of the MCU is just something that continues to to pay dividends and to breathe like life into into this fictional universe that it just Marvel continues to be so smart about how they 
how they grow and build the MCU. I think it's time for number eight, unless, uh, unless anybody has any objections. It's the movie that started it all. It's Iron Man. So, as we saw, Iron Man 2 was pretty low on the list. And Iron Man 3 was too low on the list. Uh, but the first Marvel movie is still something that uh, merits ranking in the top 10. And you know what? It still holds up really well. It is one of the best superhero, mo- uh, superhero origin movies I've ever seen. Um, and the thing that I really just cannot stress enough, we touched on this a little bit in the last episode. Iron Man was such a third rate character until this movie. Nobody knew. Nobody cared. I did because I was <laughs> like, I was a dork even among the dorks, you know, but you did not read Iron Man comics in the nineties, you know, and this movie changed everything. And, you know, 2008 feels like ancient history, even from an internet standpoint at this point, I went into this movie knowing nothing, you know, just kind of hoping that they made a good Iron Man movie, not knowing what the tone was going to be, not realizing that they were building this interconnected universe. And that was so special. And the fact that this came out the same summer as The Dark Knight just just continues to blow my mind. Uh, What are everybody's memories of Iron Man? I remember my college friend showing me the trailer for this movie, um, which, you know, I was definitely going to go see it because I I maybe wasn't a comics fan, but I was like a blockbuster movie fan um, and an action movie fan. But she was so excited um, and did have a familiarity with the comics. But it was interesting that, you know, it worked for both of us, like for her as someone who, you know, cared about this character already or cared about comics already. And for me, who didn't have any sort of relationship to the source material. And yeah, I remember seeing this movie multiple times in theaters and just, yeah, loving it and being so excited to see where the character went, especially with that ending. Again, these early MCU movies had some really good endings (laughs) that just made you want to keep watching. Um, Robert Downey Jr. is obviously incredible in it. I love the dynamic with Pepper. Um, Yeah, there's this is just a perfect movie in a lot of ways. (laughs) Yeah, this movie is so awesome. I'm glad you mentioned that it came out the same summer as uh, Dark Knight because I was in... I guess I would have been in high school. Um, And I was all about The Dark Knight. And I think I saw them both that summer. uh, And I definitely liked The Dark Knight more because it was gritty and real, like high school me new superhero movie should be. Uh, But in hindsight, like this is just as good, maybe if not better. This is just like a fantastic origin story movie. Um, I remember going into it not knowing anything about Iron Man, obviously, knowing next to nothing about Marvel, but just thinking like, even if this movie sucks and like nothing with the Iron Man actually lands for me, I know I'm going to enjoy scenes that have Robert Downey Jr. in them. And lo and behold, I really enjoyed those scenes and enjoyed the rest of it as well. And I just think it's fascinating that this entire multi, multi, multi billion dollar filmmaking universe that has spanned years and and enormous budgets and uh, enormous casts, enormous everything was just kind of built on the back of one really, really good performance. I'll set the scene on my first viewing of Iron Man. I saw it at the cinema. I think it was the first week of May 2008 and had a blast, you know. I had no idea at the time there were going to be any sequels or that there was even going to be a Marvel Cinematic Universe. My entire response was, that was a really fun movie. Okay, what's next? But um, what's next didn't mean like, what's the next MCU movie, as it kind of does for me now. (laughs) It meant, what's the next summer movie I've got to see? And that ended up being Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. (laughs) And I remember thinking at that point, I bet there will be an Iron Man 2 pretty quickly. Because... (laughs) Even though Dark Knight came out on top of Crystal Skull that year, we also got, and I wrote these down, uh, so blame Google if not all correct, The Happening, 10,000 BC, Ink Heart, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Journey to the Center of the Earth, Jumper, Eagle Eye, Hancock, Quantum of Solace, Speed Racer, which I must stress that I love, 
Um, there was blood in the water that year and Marvel Studios seemed primed to capitalise and I don't need to tell you they did but Iron Man is still a good movie if you watch it today it um, doesn't really feel as old as it is but it does seem a little quaint considering how far we've come uh, still has that rather underwhelming battle at the end and uh, I'm just going to say with Jeff Bridges because <laughs> none of us can think of what that character's name is right now clearly uh, but other than that it remains a fun watch just came to me. It's Obadiah Stane. Yeah. Yes. But I, I couldn't think of it when I went to say it. It's I just had Jeff, Jeff Bridges. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's also worth noting too, even from the start, the kind of the you know the MCU tone was in place like right from the outset. You know, uh, I think in some ways they have gotten a little lighter. Sometimes they lean a little bit more into the the rapid fire quippiness of it. But like the overall tone was there from the start. And at the time, it was hard to kind of put your finger on what that tone was, because this doesn't feel like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. It certainly doesn't feel like the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, but it's no less, you know, realistic. You know, it's just kind of a it, like and I remember at the time. So I have this cousin who does not love like genre stuff. Right. And, you know, once a year, he's like, you're allowed to take me to one movie a year. And, you know, like you gotta, it's gotta be a good one. So it's like, I'm always trying to get him on something ridiculous, you know? And I always have to give him like an elevator pitch on it. And he did, he does love Ghostbusters. He's like me, he grew up, you know, old enough to have seen Ghostbusters when it, when it was released. And the way I described Iron Man at the time was, I said, it's kind of like Ghostbusters. You know what I mean? Like that was the closest where I, that I could pinpoint what that tone was, where it's like, you have this serious world with perfectly consistent internal logic, but this irreverent, you know, kind of smart ass hero. And I still think that kind of works, right? You know, and I think um, I didn't expect it to become the tone for an entire franchise of 27 movies, but it definitely worked here. And uh, yeah, nothing but good memories about this one. Nagma in the comments just said that uh, you can't watch that final line of I am Iron Man without crying now that you know what's coming, right? And uh, it's a it's another perfect way that the MCU finds ways to echo things, uh, you know, sometimes without, you know, like it doesn't it doesn't always feel forced, which I think is really impressive. But we, we will talk about that particular moment in a few minutes. Uh, but first, we got to get to number seven on this list, don't we? <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 1, James Gunn's masterpiece, a weird space opera that just kind of happens to be set in the MCU. Uh, I adore this movie. Um, look, we talked about the second one last week, and I think the second one holds up just about as well. But this is another one where, just like Iron Man, you had no idea what you were getting when you walked into this. And I think that is a big part of the staying power here. The soundtrack, the weird characters, the wonderful performances, and, you know, as great as the whole interconnected element of the MCU is, I think Guardians benefits from being something that stands almost completely on its own. Uh, what are what are everybody else's memories about Guardians? Yeah, I mean, this... I didn't love this movie when I saw it, actually, um, that when I first saw it, and I still... I still liked it, but I think um, I've, you know, since I was a kid, I've just loved space operas. And as a kid, a lot of times that was more TV shows than than movies. Um, but the, the space opera genre is a highly competitive genre for me. Um, you know, Farscape is one of my favorite shows, and I feel like this movie has a lot of overlap with that. Um, so I really liked it, but um, I think the reason I like the second one better is because you know, it grows on some of those initial like tropes and stereotypes that are done really well in the first one, but they're allowed to evolve in the second one a little bit more. But I mean, it's, it's such a good movie. It's so like bright and colorful and creative. And, you know, I was talking about how important it was that the Avengers, um, you know, grew this world in the ways that it did. And as Mike was mentioning, um, Guardians of the Galaxy was hugely important in that way as well just um 
you know, not only giving us these new characters, but giving us an entirely new setting that was was still within this world. Um, but yeah, expanding it into science fiction in this way, into space in this way. Um, I mean, they just, the MCU has just pulled off so many um, impressive feats, and Guardians of the Galaxy is is definitely one of them. It's unbelievable how stacked this top ten is. Um, I feel like any like pretty much anything left, and even probably Iron Man and um, Avengers before it, could have a reasonable argument for the best Marvel movie. This was my favorite Marvel movie for a long time before it got eclipsed some other stuff. And then I shuffled around after repeat viewings. Um, but I think it's a fine choice for a favorite Marvel movie overall, just because it's so fun. I mean, James Gunn is pretty good at his job, as it turns out. Um, and that's <laughs> borne out so many times uh, in his superhero movie and TV show making uh, phase. Uh, I don't... it. I, I don't even know if I can necessarily articulate what works about this movie just because it just kind of knocks everything out of the park. Um, uh, all the characters fit well together. There's an emotional core. It's extremely funny. And the cast is so stacked that we you forget all the time that John C. Riley and Glenn Close were in this movie. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's just a, a huge movie that also feels intimate and personal and fun. I love it. James Gunn managed to build such an enviable world around these characters and the film. It does have some fantastic stuff. Everything with Rocket, I love. Um, in fact, I am still not quite able to think of Rocket as a CG character. Every time I see Bradley <laughs> Cooper's name in the credits on one of these films, yeah. I'm like, oh, oh, who, who is he playing? And my mind has to do these mental gymnastics to pair Cooper with Rocket. Um, I have a, like a block on it. But like Katie, I didn't love Guardians of the Galaxy the first time I saw it. I warmed to it afterwards, but there was something missing for me that even now I can't quite put my finger on. I can't tell you what it is. I wish I could. Um, but I do find it an enjoyable movie. I prefer it to the second one. So I, I'm not I'm not mad to see it here. Um, I know it's got a lot of fans, so... Everybody in the comments is yelling at us about the soundtrack. <laughs> and of course... <laughs> Of course, the soundtrack is, you know, had a major, major role, I think, in in distinguishing this movie. And it's not just the fact that this has one of those perfectly curated soundtracks. Like, it's the kind of soundtrack that you usually associate with, like, a Quentin Tarantino movie or a Wes Anderson movie, you know? And Gunn not only did that for this movie, but he gave the songs a story reason to exist within the movie itself. And the fact that the soundtrack itself is the title of a prop in the movie, you know? I think there's just all these little kind of meta touches there that help make these things land a little bit harder. Uh, you know, Flacidow says that uh, their four-year-old has been belting out songs from the soundtrack for the last 18 months. And like the fact that James Gunn made like exposed people to the raspberries to me is just like, it's just like mind blowing. You know what I mean? It's like, here's like a, like an AM radio power pop band that everybody has pretty much forgotten. And like, people might know Eric Carmen's like awful eighties solo stuff or whatever, but like the raspberries kicked ass and suddenly like the raspberries were cool again for like five minutes because of this soundtrack, you know? So, uh, Lee wants to know what everybody's favorite song on the soundtrack is. And while I am tempted to go with Go All The Way, I think mine is a song that's on the soundtrack, but I don't think actually appears in the movie. And it's Spirit in the Sky. Um, but if I have to go with one that actually appears in the movie, it is unquestionable Bowie's Moon Age Daydream. Where's everybody else? I mean, it might be kind of a basic choice, but I love Cherry Bomb. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, all I think all of my favorite songs actually come in volume two. But for this one, I like the um, the songs that kind of bookend. I like the hooked on a feeling scene, and then I like the ooh child. I also want to say my favorite from the second one is Mr. Blue Sky, oh. um, which I already had like special genre connections to because I... I think the first time I heard it, which is maybe a little embarrassing, was in um, the episode of Doctor Who Love and Monsters. So I don't know. I've, I've loved that that song in relation to it being used on soundtracks for a while. So to hear it in the second one was very exciting for me. 
Kirsty looks like she can't decide. <laughs> you kind of, you kind of, do you think we'll just forget you exist? <laughs> we'll just let it go. I, yeah. <laughs> Um, I was hoping, yeah, because I don't have a uh, good recall off the cuff, so I'm sitting here trying to remember the songs that you haven't mentioned yet. I googled it. I just, I'm just, oh, oh, right, okay, so, you know, I hadn't... It's allowed. <laughs> um, all I can think of is the song from the second one, actually, which is, is The Chain, right, by Fleetwood Mac? Ooh, they use. yeah. Cause I second love, movie has I a better Mac. soundtrack. Yeah. I'm gonna go with, uh with that which wasn't the question ah, i'll accept it <laughs> i'll accept it it's okay um no this is like really I, I i can't i can't believe this movie exists um it's another instance where some of these films because of the constant flow of marvel stuff you kind of start to take them for granted a little bit sometimes you know what i mean and then once you start talking about it you realize just how exciting it is that something this weird was kind of allowed to exist within the framework of the mcu which is not always as visually or sonically adventurous as james gunn was allowed to get here so uh i have to appreciate that i do want to pose one question to the audience and i do not expect this to be resolved like in this chat right now, it's kind of a broader question because for years I have been trying to define or articulate the very particular sci-fi aesthetic of like the mid to late seventies and early to mid eighties, where it's like, it's like kind of lived in and like a lot of like earth tone jumpsuits. It's like, like Star Trek, the motion picture and Star Trek, the Wrath of Khan, and obviously the original Star Wars trilogy, but also very much Tom Baker, Doctor Who. Like, I can't quite put my finger on what you call that aesthetic or if there is an actual name for it. Um, it's been driving me crazy for years, but Guardians has that. You know, another recent movie like the, the wonderful Psycho Gorman has that as well. Um, if anybody can help me name this, please, like, get at us like 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 hit me up on twitter or something i need to know it's it's like when you can't remember the name of something you know so anyway moving on it's time to get to number six and it is another big one folks avengers infinity war arguably the biggest there is um this is another one that i just did not not only did i not think they could pull it off i will never forget the press screening where that ending starts hitting and just like the silence in the audience and the sharp intake of breath as those final moments started unfolding. And that was a crowd of journalists, you know, like for everybody to kind of be a cynical journalist. <laughs> yeah. Like for, for everybody to be affected like that, that was a moment where I knew that, that this franchise was not slowing down anytime soon uh, i am going to turn this over to kirsty first though because i know she particularly loves infinity war yeah i put this at number one um this is my favorite mcu movie now it's ousted iron man 3 from the top before it was released there had been a lot of speculation about how cap or tony were going to die in this movie i don't know whether anyone remembers the discourse Oh, but, yes. <laughs> so I had been mentally preparing myself for that to happen. In fact, there's that there's that bit where Thanos stabs Tony on is it on Titan? And there was a reflexive gasp in the audience, like, this is it? Like no one knew what we were about to see. No one thought half these people are just going to die. And when the credits rolled, yeah, you could have heard a pin drop. Not just because of the shock, but also because Everyone was hanging on a post-credit scene to give us some kind of relief from what we'd just seen. Um, I'll never forget that experience. Um, the film itself, if I take a step back, is basically watching people you already like arrive <laughs> in a string of scenes for like two and a half hours. Um, but it's just straight up thrilling, so I can easily forgive that. It's an incredible achievement. I can't imagine the process behind the scenes of trying to include all these characters deciding what their places are and then pulling them together like it's mind-boggling i would take an entire class just on the construction and execution of infinity war and endgame <laughs> because this is a masterful 
movie. Um, and I do, I do think I prefer Endgame because it is the conclusion to the story and you get a lot of resolution for the things that happen in, in Infinity War. Um, because they also just feel like two parts of, of a whole, um, which they're intended to, to be. But yeah, it really is interesting. Like when you think, when you think back on this movie, so much of, so much of what I remember is the ending, but it's not a, it's not a short movie. Like a lot happens. Um, (laughs) And a lot of it is, as you said, Christy, just just characters you like arriving. But I think they just nail, they nail the characterization of of these people so, so well and so efficiently. Um, and getting to see them interact in different formations, and also seeing, um, you know, a lot of the fallout from Civil War. Um, yeah, and that ending. It just, it's so, it's so, so, so good. I feel like the, sometimes the more you like a movie, the harder it is to talk about it. And <laughs> I'm feeling that way right now with Infinity War. Um, because, you know, especially in the same, you know, discussion we, in which we discussed the Avengers and how well, you know, how good that movie is considering how much it has to do. This movie arguably has, you know, more to do. Maybe the weights, the the stakes are a little bit lower in some ways, but it has many more characters and many more stories to balance, and it does it even better. So now I need to go and rewatch Infinity War. <laughs> um, you're absolutely right, Katie, that this movie is like, it's like a logistical miracle. It's like you watch this movie and marvel at it the way you would like a skyscraper or like a mm. bridge or something. It's just so, <laughs> so well crafted. Um, yeah. I, I guess I am a little surprised to see it this low, but it just, it speaks to how strong like the top 10 is. Uh, I think there's an argument to be made that this is the most well executed Marvel movie effort ever, just because of the difficulty level alone. Um Endgame seems like it would be just as hard to pull off, but you have to remember Endgame has about like half the amount of characters this does <laughs> due to a very particular <laughs> plot point. Um, <laughs> and, but I, I mean, like another thing that I really love about this movie is that like they didn't have to necessarily be this creative with the plot. Like the, the, the Marvel had become such a big deal at this point that simply them bringing all these heroes together is kind of a victory on itself. And the movie would have made, you know, $8 trillion anyway, like it did. But I feel like kind of the difference between why Marvel has been so successful in recent years where DC not necessarily hasn't been is that they don't just take like the team up for granted. Like you have to team the characters up and then something astonishing has to happen. And something truly astonishing happens at the end of Infinity War. Um, Something that I never would have expected to happen in if you'd give me like a thousand guesses. Uh, so yeah, it is, it's just like, it's a movie that should, is very admirable and easy to love. Um, and its position on this list is probably just a reflection of how good a lot of Marvel movies are. Yeah. And I think a lot of times when you call a movie admirable, you don't necessarily enjoy it that much, but this is an admirable movie that is actually just really entertaining as well. Um, And I would like to say, as someone who has gone on record saying that Doctor Strange is my nemesis, I do think this is Doctor Strange's best movie, or at least it's the one that I like how he is used best. (laughs) What did everybody think was happening at the very end at first? Like on your first viewing, when everybody started like crumbling and blowing away, what did you think was happening? Because I believe the first person was Bucky, right? Hmm. Um, And in my head, I was like, oh, wow, okay, so Thanos is like, he just used one of the gems or like maybe he's using like the time stone to like make Bucky his real age and he's supposed to be dead and dust by now. Like that was like the first thing that went through my head. And then everybody else starts crumbling. Um, Did anybody else like get it right away or am I the only dummy? (laughs) I think I got it and I was also I was more worried about who being chosen, who was being erased mm-hmm. and how likely I thought that they would come back cuz I remember when T'Challa disappears and I was like, okay, well they're not going to get rid of T'Challa, which um but yeah, so I think I knew it was going on, but I was already like thinking about 
their prominence in the MCU to determine how worried and devastated I should be. <laughs> and I was still very much devastated. And I think especially, um, you know, thinking about Peter's um, disintegration. I don't even, like, years later, and I know there's all, like, we have a lot of verbiage around what we call these things, but I still don't feel like I have the right words. Um, yeah, but that that was very, very emotional and moving. And, yeah, I think... I think for a movie that was so much about character and character dynamics, um, to to both see see those losses and to see other characters we really care about react to those losses was just like so devastating. And yeah, I think one of one of my favorite like movie and theater movie moments um, to experience, which is weird because it's very sad, but it, I like <laughs> I like. You know, I think as people who deconstruct and analyze media, we often do see things coming or maybe especially when we're watching something for work, it's it can be easy to become emotionally detached. And so I really value those times when I'm just overwhelmed with emotion. And that happened for me with both Infinity War and Endgame. So, um, yeah, I love these. I love these movies. I'll just I guess I'll just keep saying that. Yeah, I knew it was happening. Maybe I'm just built different. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, Mike. <laughs> yeah. I also knew it was happening, but I don't think I emotionally processed it until about six months later, if that helps. <laughs> like, until I saw the memes of, like, you know, Mr. Stark, I don't feel so good. Like, I wasn't, until I was able to laugh at it, like, I definitely didn't process what yeah. happened. <laughs> I think knowing I it was. Say, I, I don't know if it registered with me until the credits rolled that that couldn't be permanent because of who they killed. Um, so I, it, that, I was a little slow on the uptake there. But once the credit rolled around, I caught my breath. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> We're good. Cause, yeah, because when Bucky disappeared, I'm like, okay, like I love Bucky, but I feel like he could, he could leave. <laughs> and the, the course of the MCU would not be, you know, too, too knocked. Off course. <laughs> anyway, I see folks in the comments yelling that this is too low. It's number six. Like, what do you want? Like, <laughs> There's too many good movies. Yeah, we're in, we're in like stiff competition territory now. Like, this is this is we're we're kind of like in one of those ridiculous hot streaks that you know only great art ever gets into. It's like. It's like if we were trying to rank the Beatles albums, like you get to a point with the later Beatles output where you're like, I, I don't know, like, I guess it's number six, like, like, and, and yeah. just to drive this metaphor, like completely into the ground, Infinity War and Endgame are like the rubber soul and revolver of the MCU. <laughs> like these are two absolute masterpieces. And maybe, you know, on one day you're more in the mood for Rubber Soul and maybe on another day you're more in the mood for Revolver. But like, these are both, you know, five star entries. So uh, let's not get too hung up on this. No, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so yes. what is the Doctor Strange movie in terms of a Beatles album? Well, like <laughs> seven Beatles albums. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like or, um, I don't know. So you're saying it's not in the top seven. It's like, yeah. it's for sale. Like, it's good. You know, it's like, like a there's B -side no bad Beatles albums. Like, it's <laughs> I think we can all agree that our number one is the Sgt. Pepper analog. Yes. Unless you're like me and prefers Revolver to Sergeant Pepper. But like, this is what I'm saying, <laughs> folks. Like, I think you're right, though, Mike. Like, I think if you asked me to rank these movies on a different day, you know, the general shape of them would be the, of this list would be the same. But yeah, I think when you get to movies that are this good and this important within the MCU, subjectivity and mood can play. And also, like, how recently you've watched them can play a huge role. Absolutely. Absolutely. Doc Calamari suggests that the only solution is adding platinum tiers to each ranking. <laughs> and uh, we may have to build this in if we do this again in a year. Uh, I know. I can imagine it being like, <laughs> no, what? and That's... at 1C and 1D, we have. <laughs> On our list, where would you guys begin the platinum tier? Because I think I would have began it at seven with Guardians. Everything on is platinum tier. I don't think I know enough about the music industry to weigh in. <laughs> oh, I was <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we're kind of in the platinum tier now of the MCU. Like, we're in the end game now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just we're about any one of now. these, 
it, like it, it, none of these would have surprised me if they would have come in at number one on the list. Yeah. Uh, like, you and know, none of so, them would have upset me. I wouldn't have been like, no, which no, maybe I, other people, I feel like Kirstie has some strong opinions. But. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I have some strong opinions, but I try to keep them to myself wherever possible. So. Sorry for <laughs> We're blowing, okay. up, blowing up your spot. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think it's time for number five. We're heading for the top five, folks. Let's go. Another war movie. It is Captain America Civil War momentous for a number of reasons, not the least of which be, being that it introduced Spider-Man to the MCU. And this is a good reminder, folks, to check out our sponsor, Plex, because this episode of Marvel Stand is sponsored by Plex. They are the current streaming home of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, which I guess is technically part of the MCU now, thanks to No Way Home, right? Anyway, you can watch Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man trilogy for free, presented by Crackle on Plex. This limited time engagement ends on March 1st, so swing on over to Plex while you can. Plex also has over 50,000 free on-demand titles and over 200 live TV channels. So download the Plex app today, free on all your favorite devices to start watching. Now, back to our regularly scheduled ranking. Let's talk about Captain America Civil War. Kirstie, I'm turning this over to you first again, because I know this is another big one for you. <laughs> yeah, I do love Civil War. I don't love it more than Infinity War, but I do love it. <laughs> um I always felt like it always felt like that's like a Captain America movie and more like Avengers 2.5. Um and in many ways it felt like a test to see if they could use this many characters and make it work in one movie. And also a test to see if people would understand what was going on because this movie doesn't go out of its way to explain how these characters got to where they are in their lives. Um that exposition isn't really part of the story. So for the most part, it expects the audience to have seen the other movies, know who all these other people are and what their relationships with each other have become. And it worked. And at this point, it felt like Marvel must have known, OK, we can do like an Infinity War or Endgame style event movie. People are here for it. Um, whereas after Age of Ultron, perhaps there was maybe a little doubt. Yeah, I ranked this movie lower than it it is on this list. Um I agree with Christy that it is definitely more of an Avengers movie than it is a Captain America movie. And I think as someone who really loves the Captain America movies, um, that was really disappointing for me. I just wanted it to be more about Captain America. Um, I also, you know, I wrote an article for Den of Geek when Eternals came out about how Eternals does this kind of setup better than Civil War did which is to say you know this was presented to us as like kind of an ideological battle um between you know in which all these characters would decide kind of where they land on the question of like institutional authority and um it is presented as that in the movie and then it kind of changes into very personal reasons for the battle which is maybe fine if you start the movie like that or um, yeah, just don't kind of present this ideological side, but it really just ends up being, you know, Bucky killed Tony's parents and <laughs> Tony is upset about that. And Steve loves Bucky. So, you know, that's how it kind of breaks down, which is not to say that it isn't still enjoyable to see how these characters choose their sides and to see them face off against each other. Um, but I think if this movie had come earlier in the MCU before we already knew so much about these characters and where their moral code um, lies, then I think it would have been maybe a bad movie. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's pretty good. <laughs> Katie, I really, I, I really liked your... Um... <clears throat> like the issue with the, your take that the issue with this movie um, is that it doesn't really establish the ideological battle lines that well, since you, since you've made it on Eternals, so much of that I've, I've kind of like borrowed it as my own now, because I feel, <laughs> I definitely feel the same way. Um, however, like the personal stuff in this movie is so intense and acute that like uh, top five might be pushing it a bit, but it is a fantastic movie with like one of the better, 
third acts ever in a Marvel movie. All I can think about when I think of this movie is, um, and it's like a beaten to hell Tony just crying out like, uh, you don't deserve that shield. My father made that shield to Cap mm. and him dropping it. And that is like one of the coldest things that has happened in any of these Marvel movies. And it's so complicated because also Steve knew his father, which just yes. adds this element. They're like peers, like it's, yeah. it's wild. It is it's just so like, good. there's so much layers to it. And it is so good. Um, also use this opp- as the opportunity to sp- to speak on Cleveland, Ohio's um, <laughs> contributions to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Because you this really held moved- out for an impressive. I know. Long time, That's why I like. I've been sweating and shaking for twenty two films, just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> so hard to save it during Avengers. Um, but this comes from you know the Russo brothers, who basically take the Infinity franchise through to the very end from this point on. Um, and one of the one of the biggest reactions I've ever heard in a movie theater is when I saw this film in a Cleveland suburb, and there's a scene where Zemo is going to visit um, some ex uh, Hydra agent, and the establishing shot is like the snowy hellscape that just looks like a backwater town in Siberia. And then the Chiron reads Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> the entire theater erupts with laughter. <laughs> Um, so I like this movie for that reason as well. I will say this is a very good T'Challa movie as well. He, <laughs> I love his character arc here. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much that's going on about this movie. The more we talk in this movie, the more we talk about it too. The more I'm like, oh yeah, it does that well. It does that well. So it's like even while I do think it like um, fails in that ideological construction and execution, yeah, there's so much that it does well. You know, I voted this movie way lower, but. And and every but the thing is, every time I have to engage in a discussion about civil war, it's impossible for me to articulate why I would rank it lower because this movie rules. Like this movie is awesome. And it's all the more impressive because it's based on a very bad comic. Like the the the, the Civil War comics are bad, like they're really bad. And Nagma in the comments was just asking, like, hey, you know, team Iron Man or Team Cap. When you watch this movie. There's a genuine, that's a genuine question you have to ask yourself. And it's not ever really resolved, you know? Like, there are reasons you would be Team Iron Man or Team Cap. Whereas in the comics, like, I wouldn't I wouldn't trust anybody who would be t- Team Iron Man based on the way that this is presented in the comics. So the movie improves on the source material tremendously. Came out the same summer as the dreaded Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, which had... You know, so it's like, oh, this is gonna be the thing now, the heroes fighting each other. But like Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, like never articulates like why these two are mad at each other. And it's just like these two steroidal dunderheads like <laughs> like screaming at each other. Whereas when Cap and Tony are like really getting into it in, in those final scenes, it's heartbreaking. Like it's really heartbreaking. Like you're just like, I like stop fighting, guys. Like, stop. Like, I totally get it. Like, please. So that's incredibly effective. Like the fact that a movie with this many characters, this many action scenes, this much going on, it introduces two major players in the MCU with Spider-Man and Black Panther. There is no reason this movie should work. And yet here it is in the top five. And yeah, I put it lower. And I think Katie kind of got at this a little bit before I think I just always kind of resented this movie for not actually being Captain America 3. You know, if this was Avengers Civil War, I probably would have put this in my top five. Like, it's just some subconscious thing. Mm -hmm. Or if we had more Captain America after, I don't know. Yeah. Because this is like, obviously we get him a lot in Infinity War and Endgame, but this is his last solo outing. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? And there's still plenty of cap in it. Like, it's not like cap gets short change. It's just- Yeah, there's like, the helicopter scene. Oh man, yeah. Like, <laughs> I was gonna try that, to do it. I just can't. Oh yeah. <laughs> I could do it. I just, I don't want to right now. Yeah, also known as the <laughs> shame Mike into going to the gym scene. Yeah, yes. like I, uh... <laughs> so no, there, there's like, you know what it is? I think it's just after how, like first Avenger and Winter Soldier, like I had 
like a trajectory for what a Captain America movie <laughs> looked like in my head. And instead I got an Avengers movie and then I'm going to sit here and complain that I got an Avengers yeah. movie. Come on. <laughs> I do like thinking of it as like the first movie in the like infinity war and game trilogy. Like I think if I think of it more like that, I might like it more. Um, but yeah, there's a lot. I like. rather seen serpent society. Remember when he <laughs> teased <Yes>. that? <laughs> <laughs> because the serpent society, look, the the you know i i keep defending falcon and winter soldier right even though falcon and winter soldier was not a great show but falcon and winter soldier was very much like mike bait fan service because it took a lot of elements from a very specific run of late 80s captain america comics written by mark grunwald and that is where the serpent society would have come from you know what i mean so yes when they jokingly announced captain america 3 as serpent society i was genuinely hyped like i was the only person who was like yes they're doing the serpent society and then it's like oh wait they're doing civil war okay so like <laughs> <laughs> i'm still holding out hope that maybe like falcon and winter soldier season 2 will be that serpent society story um <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know nobody nobody else i mean i'm doing i'm doing it for you i don't really have any personal <laughs> you know katie's like please shut him up <laughs> um all right i think it's time for number four and this could have been number one it's black panther I would not have been the least bit surprised if Black Panther would have landed at number one on this list. And I think there is a case to be made. Um, this movie is wonderful. Uh, it's Ryan Coogler who made the best legacy sequel of all time with Creed. Uh, it is just perfectly, perfectly cast uh, at all levels. But Chadwick Boseman is just a transformative talent in this. Um, yeah, I, I I can't believe this is another movie that I can't even believe it exists, uh, and you know I kind of you know it's kind of a shame that the the future of this character and this franchise is like in such uh, disarray at the moment. But what are everybody's thoughts on Black Panther? I mean, Black Panther is great. <laughs> I mean, this has been discussed so many times, um, but I do I I was thinking a lot about this when we were discussing Shang Chi as well, where. You know, my favorite Marvel movies, and I think a lot a lot of people's favorite Marvel movies are ones that are tied to an interesting theme or, yeah, an exploration of a theme that really hasn't been done before in the MCU or in the superhero genre. And both Shang-Chi and Black Panther are really interesting explorations of, like, diaspora. And in, in this movie, it's, like, really related to Killmonger, who, you know, left um, Wakanda when he was a child. Is he, I can't remember, was he ever there or was he, he was born in Oakland. Do you guys remember? <laughs> Whatever. He doesn't get to grow up in Wakanda. <laughs> um, and yeah, like so much of his pain is just so valid. Um, and the movie does such a good job articulating that. And it's connected to, to real world, real world pain and injustice. Um, it just, it elevates the superhero genre in so many ways. Um, and I think like there's so much that is new about Black Panther that people are responding to, but I think I think we tend to under count we we don't we don't talk about theme enough, and I think that is one of the novelties of this movie that really struck a chord with people and made it feel fresh. And I really I really hope the MCU continues to bring in um directors and screenwriters who haven't had a chance to tell a story in the superhero genre because yeah there's just so much that's possible I think when you use this framework and these tropes and stereotypes to to explore a theme that hasn't been explored in this way before so yeah Black, Black Panther is great <laughs> um yeah, this is another one. This is similar to my Guardians of the Gal Galaxy experience, where I was pretty sure this was the best Marvel movie after I saw it. And it's only in hindsight where I kind <laughs> no, of like... No, this one. No, this yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> it's only in hindsight when I've been like reshuffling my list that it got bumped down a bit. Um, the reason the, the reason it bumped down is, uh, it mentioned in the comments, but the third act fight scene is a bit listless. And I feel like this is kind of where 
Marvel's third act issues really started to rear their head because leading up to it is such a rich, fascinating story. Um, and I just think the CGI, quite frankly, is not good enough. Like it looks like, you know, two computer animated Black Panthers fighting each other um, where the, um, this, the emotional impact of just having more close-up shots on Chadwick Boseman and Michael B. Jordan in those final moments would be astonishing. Mm particularly for how that fight ends with um, Killmonger's absolutely show-stopping like, last words. Mm. Um, so yeah, the movie suffers from that a bit, but up to that point, it's so cool. This kind of feels like, half of this movie feels like Marvel's Lord of the Rings, and the other half feels like Marvel's James Bond. Um, like T'Challa undercover in a suit at, at a casino is so cool. Wakanda feels like a very lived in fantasy universe with like coherent social structure and uh, laws and, and just like a lived in people. Um, so yeah, this is like two thirds of just a phenomenal movie that I think is let down a bit by some CGI shenanigans in the last act. I do wish, I actually do wish there were more exploration of Wakanda because I feel like we get a lot of like T'Challa's immediate world, but I don't feel like we get as much about the people who live there. And especially for a place that is like fictional, uh, I would like more of that. But again, there's a lot to do in this movie and hopefully we'll see more of Wakanda um, in future Black Panther installments. Yeah, Black Panther is a great movie. Um, I think <laughs> it speaks volumes that this is the top ranked origin movie here. Mm. Uh, everyone was on top form. Chadwick was amazing. Michael B. Jordan, cool as hell. I think we'll see him back in the MCU at some stage um, now that we're in the multiverse. Um, I hope so, because he's he's terrific. Uh, Kugler and his team did some fantastic world building here. It's been it's been hard to hear about how much they've gone through making the sequel because you do want to see more of Wakanda. You want to see more of the people and their history and what their future looks like. And this movie really only gives us a window into everything that that world has to offer. Um, but it's a damn near perfect window that um, just has that uh, kind of crap fight between <laughs> Killmonger and Black Panther at not the great. end. It's just not great, but the rest is, yeah, it's great. What Alex said about this being Marvel's Lord of the Rings, I think is very accurate because if this movie existed even more than Guardians, right? Because Guardians feels very standalone. This movie does all of the work necessary to build that world. And I think if this movie just existed completely independently of the MCU, it still would have been a massive success. Um, like, I, like, it shows you just enough. It explains what it needs to explain. It leaves you desperately wanting to know more about Wakanda and the logic of you know, the the magic and the science and everything else that goes in there. And like, look, obviously we're gonna get more of this in a sequel. And there's also a Wakanda TV series in development for Disney Plus. Like this is this is a very rich vein of vibranium to be mined here. And I really want like, like I want all of it, you know? And this isn't even getting into the obvious like cultural significance of the film, which I'm not really qualified to speak to, but I know that this, was a way for like, this is like a perfect way to get more people into this genre. And that's what this really should be about, right? Like is is letting more people see themselves reflected in these stories. And I can't think of a better way to do it than Black Panther. So, um, you know, wish we had more time with Chadwick Boseman though. Mm -hmm. Should we move on to number three? Avengers Endgame. Oh. Here we go. Uh, I am going to confess now, this was my number one. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, this is the one that I really thought was going to be number one on the overall list. Alec, as the vote keeper, is there any light that you can shed on uh, how this sat on the ballots? Well, I can tell you that this is the reader's champion. Okay. Um, this got the full 27 points from the readers. Uh, I will also say that starting with um, starting with Infinity War at six and ending with number two, 
So what's coming up next, all of those are separated by a mere 15 points. So Infinity War, Civil War, um, Black Panther, this, and then what comes next are all pretty closely bunched together. And then our number one won by a landslide. Wow, yeah, well, we'll get to that too, which was also surprising because I fully expected it to be Endgame. Um, I cannot imagine a more perfect way to close this first, you know, MCU epic than the way Endgame did it. Uh, Nagma in the comments had asked earlier why only the original Avengers survived, right? And I think, you know, survived the end of Infinity War. And I think it was just specifically because they wanted that team to be the one to kind of, you know, have their curtain call and also usher in the next generation with Endgame. And that's exactly what happens. And, you know, there are times I complain about fan service. Um, you know, I, I don't really think it's particularly healthy. I think that the continued trend in the Star Wars franchise and even in the MCU with stuff like No Way Home, like this idea of like everything having to be a love letter to fans at all times, I think it's dangerous and ultimately isn't really going to serve stories all that way. Endgame, on the other hand, is full of fan service, but it earns every single one of those moments. And if it, it like it earns it within its own runtime and it also earns it with these powerful callbacks to other moments. And it never feels like a nudge and a wink. It always feels like catharsis. In particular, as we see here, Cap holding Mjolnir, which is something that like comic book fans had been dreaming of, like since before we even knew that a movie like this was possible. So um, I love Endgame. I love every single moment of it. And I think really the, the perfect kind of cherry on top is the final shot with Stephen Peggy. Uh, something that I also did not see coming. I really didn't think they were going to find a way to allow these two characters to have a happy ending. Um, it broke me up the first time I saw it. It breaks me up every time. I love this movie. It was my number one. Don't see that changing anytime soon. Where's everybody else? I recently was able to get my friend to watch this movie having... She she's only ever watched Iron Man, but it was like when it came out. So I was really curious to see if it did or didn't work for her. And she actually got a lot out of it, which was very interesting. We did get to like one of the final scenes and she was like, so wait, what's with the glove? And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, one of the smartest decisions I think this movie makes is not is having that five-year time jump because it really means that the stakes of Infinity War, well, maybe not quite as dire as they could have been, they still have a real weight. Um, those actions have consequences and these characters have had to live with that loss um, and will continue to have to live with, you know, the permanent loss of some characters like Tony, um, but also, you know, a world that's forever changed. And I think the MCU has had some successes and failures in, in seeing that play out past Endgame, but I think it's an incredibly interesting choice to have made um, and to kind of cement or seed some of that um, dramatic potential for the MCU moving forward while also wrapping up so many of the storylines of characters who we've been with for, you know, 10 plus years all in one movie. I mean, we talked a lot about this during Infinity Game and how impressive this execution is, but I, I don't think it can be stated enough. Um, I love this movie. I don't I don't love the ending um, with Steve and Peggy as much as Mike does, um, but yeah, there's there's this movie is is a masterpiece. <laughs> Completely agree. Like, I, I actually didn't vote for this number one overall. I think I had this third. Um, where we have it here and I'm starting to rethink that because I like this movie it's flawless it's so good um, and you're right Mike like uh, the, the the in the incoming creep of fan service into everything uh, is fairly insidious and like not good for our culture as a whole <laughs> but like there's a way to do it right and it's here and I think it's because like that fan service is wrapped around a very creative 
coherent and well executed movie like every if if filmmaking or acting or directing is just about making choices um this movie almost always makes the more interesting choice when it has the opportunity to um like this movie opens with a cold open uh that sees like clint barton a character we've not seen in a while watch his family disappear and then it just kind of like smoothly transitions via just kind of like a folk song into tony stark in space it just flows together so well um the, the title the opening title sequence doesn't even come until after thor has chopped uh thanos's head off uh, there's nothing, it's another movie that you so easily could have phoned in because they had the goods, they had the character, they had they had the, the right characters, they had the right plot, but it's still just creative every step of the way. And like every new moment is just interesting in its own way. Uh, it's a phenomenal movie. I love it. Again. I mean, when I saw that um, the Endgame had won the reader's vote, because I remember seeing that and thinking, well, that's it. Like Endgame will take it. You know, it's, there's not going to be too much of a change here. Um, I don't know if I if we'd done this ranking in 2019 or 2020, would Endgame have been number one? Maybe. Um, I think it's at least likely. Um, I think since then, uh, it's not that our love for it for it has cooled. Like, as as for the movie, I think Endgame wraps up the OG Avengers stories in a satisfying way. And it does so with such confidence in the audience's love for those characters. Um, the end battle with Thanos is perfect. Those two moments with Cap, first wielding Mjolnir, ultimately proving Tony wrong when he said that everything special about Steve came out of a bottle. Then when he's staggering out onto the battlefield to his death before the por portals open. It's just, as Martin Scorsese would definitely not say, this is cinema. <laughs> um... <laughs> And then, of course, you have Tony sacrificing his life, linking back to Cap's assertion that he'd never choose the sacrifice play because he's too self-involved. It just completes the circle between all of it so well. And just by the by, that Alan Silvestri score, too, just, yeah. All great. Perfect. I love how before we started the stream, we were like, okay, we're going to do this in like an hour. It's going to be great. <laughs> Only 10 movies. But these movies are so good. And we all have so much to say about them. <laughs> I have more to say about this one still. Yeah. <laughs> I just will, yeah. uh, like you mentioned uh, previously about uh, in the comments, you know, wondering why it was kind of the original Avengers lineup for the end of this. That always struck me as like kind of a contractual thing, but one that like, you know, I'm sure they had Chris Hemsworth and, you know, Robert Downey Jr. signed for longer than they did uh, like Chadwick Boseman at that point. But one thing I really like about this movie is like it, it really disguises that really well, because like you have the original <laughs> Avengers lineup, but then you also have a raccoon, the blue lady, like it feels <laughs> it feels satisfyingly random while at the same time honoring the characters it's supposed to honor. It's also worth pointing out how far this movie departs. I mean, Infinity War did as well, but you know, when Thanos first appears in the Avengers, everybody goes, aha, the Infinity Gauntlet, right? And the Infinity Gauntlet is a classic Marvel story and blah, 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 blah. But like, it's not something, you know, that could really be adapted properly for the comics. And every single thing that I would be like, well, of course, we know, how, we know what's going to happen because we've read the Infinity Gauntlet comics. Endgame is as far removed from any actual Marvel comic storyline as you could possibly get. Like, even somebody who is steeped in comic book lore like this dork right here is like is completely surprised at every turn by this movie and the choices that it makes as alex said aren't just the the story choices but it's the emotional choices you know and again i worry a little bit that just as everybody learned the like all the competition learned the wrong lesson from the avengers They're like aha shared universes and team-up movies right and it's just like no, you gotta you gotta earn that, you know. And then it's like, okay, well, then stuff has to get bigger, and we gotta do fan service. It's like, well, no, you gotta earn that too. I don't even know how Marvel is ever gonna do a movie on the scale of Endgame again. Like, I know in ten years they're gonna do it and they're gonna pull it off because every time you doubt Kevin Feige, he goes, oh yeah. But 
I can't imagine how they're going to do this. Like I, and I think it would be folly to even try. Um, but maybe, you know, the kids that are coming up on these movies now that maybe were, weren't seeing Avengers for the first time in theaters, you know, that were seeing these on Blu-ray and on streaming and on Disney plus for the first time, they might feel very differently about this new crop of characters. I don't know, but Endgame is always going to have a special place in my heart. And it didn't have to be this way. It could have, it could have been a much worse movie. And uh, yeah. So do we go on to number two here? We do, but I can't imagine how we're going to argue for two and one after this. Like I'm worried oh, that the man. readers got it right. <laughs> it's after <laughs> our love letter. Like, yeah, it's, it's, true. it's very true. Let's but, find out. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously folks, uh, these next two are certainly going to be critical favorites and I don't think anybody's going to argue too hard against them. Let's have it. It's Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Which rules? Uh, <laughs> and for many, many years, if you would have asked me what my favorite MCU movie was, it would have been this one. Um, and it is still pretty much just about my ideal of what I want most superhero movies to be and especially what i think captain america movies should be um what about the rest of you i ranked this as my number one which could have been a force of habit because it has been my favorite mcu movie for so long um but i also think as at as we've mentioned before at this point it's like catch me on a different day but i do love this movie um you know especially like reflecting on where it came in the course of the mcu it really you know, after Iron Man 2 just really dropped the ball on doing something interesting with <laughs> Tony's character or giving us a new story or new um, elements to his character, especially after that ending um, of Iron Man 1, Captain America, the Winter Soldier just really, um, yeah, it just uses that time jump, that like very odd situation of, of Steve having you know, been in the ice for 70 years um, and having him have to acclimate to this new world um, just so incredibly well. Um, you know, it does that well, it does character well, but it also puts it within this um, this spy story that is like thematically complex in a lot of ways. Um, I, uh, yeah, I feel like, again, after, it is true, after arguing about, about Endgame, I'm just like, this is a good movie, I swear. Um, but I also, I do love, you know, the third act fight scene, because there's a lot of really good fight choreography in this, in this movie. But I do think, like, some of the earlier stuff is maybe a little bit better, especially, um, you know, seeing him go on to that ship at the beginning of the movie, um, and the way that's shot. But I love that the climax of this movie is... Steve choosing to stop fighting because that's such a big part of his character in the first one and in the second one and in the Avengers that he, he can do this all day, right? He'll keep fighting, but sometimes, um, the, you know, the best choice or the choice that's most in line with your moral code is to, is to stop fighting. Um, and that, that surprised me. Um, and I thought was really interesting and still is one of the more interesting, um, third act, battle choices i guess um yeah i love this movie i also like i love stephen bucky so <laughs> that's that's also an aspect of it um yeah i don't know what do you guys think <laughs> i think this was my this was another this was my favorite for a while and then it kind of went back to top three uh it is worth saying that this is the most aggressively cleveland of all of this <laughs> <laughs> i uh when I, I was working a different job down in downtown Cleveland, this came out and I couldn't take my usual route to work for an entire summer because they were filming that bridge scene um, mm. where Winter Soldier attacks Cap and And, and Natasha. you still like this movie despite And I still that. like it, even though it interrupted my uh, <laughs> com daily commute. Um, this movie is awesome. And I think, I think it, it got hip to something important about where the MCU was going before the rest of the MCU itself did which is that um, superhero movies take up so much oxygen in the movie space now that there's not a lot of room for kind of like maybe the slightly smaller scale genre movies that we've gotten used to, like say a spy thriller. And that's what I like about this one so much is that it's just like a pure on espionage classic 
um, that just happens to have a couple of characters in comic book outfits. Um, and it's executed so well. The fight choreography is so real. Um, the characters, I mean, like the Russo brothers and then the writers who are McFeely and some, I can't remember, Marcus? Marcus, uh, yeah. Marcus. Anywho, they have such a great handle on these characters. It's an awesome movie. Um, and I'm not sure there's a more enjoyable scene in the MCU than before we get started, does anybody want to get off? Um, yeah, it's a it's a solid action spy movie. Um, the helicarrier sequence at the end doesn't really do it for me, uh, but the rest of the film is exciting and intriguing. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard to care too much about that. Um, one thing that always bothered me about it was they set up the chemistry between Steve and Natasha so well here, and then they didn't go anywhere with it, which seems a shame because then they they pushed Bruce Bruce and Natasha together, and they have no chemistry. And, and they also perhaps... pushed Steve and um, what's Sharon her name? Sharon, Sharon together. Yeah. <laughs> But maybe fans of the comics were even hoping for more of a vibe between Bucky and Natasha to develop, but it never has. Um, this is just a pure Stucky film. It's about that painful central relationship, uh, mm -hmm. Steve's inability to just follow orders in this modern world where there are so many grey areas. Um, yeah, it's solid. I don't think um, I don't think I had it in my top ten. <laughs> um, which is not to say that Winter Soldier is mid. I just yeah, there are just so, so many good MCU movies. I think it just must have bumped slightly out of the top 10. I did watch this movie at one point with my friends who were not really paying attention to the news around it. It was well after the movie had come out and they were so surprised when it's revealed that the Winter Soldier is Bucky. It was wow. like the sweetest thing <laughs> <laughs> to experience. It's like, obviously, but also, you know, when you're so tapped into just basic like casting or even yeah, like if you know if you do a quick Google search about the characters, um, that is pretty obvious. So, yeah, there's just lots of different levels to enjoy these movies on, and I like I like watching things with people who are a little less uh, aware of <laughs> all of that. You know, earlier I was talking about how good it is when these depart from the comics, right? But this is in, in several ways quite faithful to a very specific arc in the comics, which was written by Ed Brubaker, which brought Bucky back from the dead. And back in the day, if you were a comics fan, you know, everybody knows nobody, in, it used to be like nobody in comics stays dead except for, you know, Bucky Barnes and Uncle Ben. And, you know, and then eventually you couldn't say Bucky Barnes anymore. And I remember when these comics were coming out, you know, pre MCU. And it was like, are they bringing back Bucky? And it's like, they better not bring back Bucky. This is the dumbest idea ever. Like it's so important to cap that this character stay dead forever. And not only did they bring Bucky back, it ended up being like one of the greatest Captain America comic stories ever told. And those stories in particular, probably more than anything else, I think, inform the overall look and tone of the MCU. So to see it adapted here um, was really special at the time, you know, before like you start thinking in terms of like, well, gosh, like eventually are we just always gonna know what's happening in these movies, you know? And it still managed to advance a broader MCU story. It still managed to have something to say you know, about the creeping surveillance state in the United States, like much in the way that the Dark Knight had attempted to do that a couple years earlier. Like this movie had some ambitions that I think we don't usually associate with the MCU. And I do wish there was more space for smaller, grittier stories like this. Falcon and the Winter Soldier tried, didn't really quite succeed, you know, but I think as great as this movie is, and it is still absolutely one of my favorites. I wish that there was more room in the MCU to keep exploring this, you know? Like, I still feel like maybe just because now we're in this like awkward setting up new phases point with the MCU. So everything still has to feel like it's laying groundwork. Whereas at this point in phase two of the MCU, everything felt really comfortable in its own skin, you know? Um, so. I don't really know where I was going with that. I just like talking about this movie. So, uh, <laughs> um, 
But, you know, the other thing that Katie mentioned is, is the, that awesome fight scene at the beginning on the boat. And this is something that I think gets lost in Cap's characterization a lot. In the comics, particularly in the late 80s comics, um, but even going back as far as when Jack Kirby and Stan Lee revived the character in the mid-60s, Cap's whole thing was that he that is the best fighter in the MCU. You know what I mean? Like, he is just the best hand-to-hand -hand combatant in the Marvel Universe. And this movie kind of gets at that a little bit, you know? And and one of the things that we loved about What If, when we talked about the Captain Carter episode, was that Captain Carter was allowed to do things in animation physically that you could never get a live action Captain America to do. Um, but Winter Soldier really admirably captures that spirit, particularly in that first fight with Batrock. So yeah, love this movie. Wouldn't have been surprised if it was number one. Still surprised that it beat Endgame, but you know what? Represent, if you haven't watched this in a while, go check it out again. Is it time? The time are we, are we ready for number one? All right, folks. So if you have been watching uh, and you want to read some other thoughts about this movie, we are also publishing this ranking as a list on denigeek.com. And I am actually going to hit publish on this right now. Whoa. So you get to see Ooh. kind of, uh, yeah, not, <laughs> not really like super exciting, but you know, it's kind of like a little uh, peek behind the curtain here. Uh, yeah, so we are actually publishing our complete ranking of the best and worst MCU movies on the Denny Geek front page. I wish right we had now. like a big red button or something. To yeah, do I this. know, like <laughs> like a big shiny candy-like button to push. No, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, that is now live on the front page of DennyGeek.com. And of course, you can check out all our coverage on DennyGeek.com slash Marvel. But it's time for number one, the greatest MCU movie ever made as voted on by Denny Geek staff. And fans, bring it on. <laughs> Ragnarok. That confetti feels like appropriate. It to does feel the aesthetic of Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> it really does. Um, this movie rules. Uh, also kind of falls under the category of like, can't believe it exists. Like who would have thought <laughs> that the best Thor movie, not only would be the best Thor movie, but I can get behind this as the best Marvel movie. I really can. Um, this movie is, it's just, it's just wild. It's just completely wild. And it is also just about the most beautiful of the, of the MCU flicks. Like mm -hmm. it's gorgeous to look at. It's fun. It's chaotic. It's just wacky. That's um, yeah. yeah. That, like, look at that. Um, you, that's not really what we usually associate with these flicks. So um what do you all think about this before I start ranting and raving again? I mean, this movie is delightful uh, in every way. Um, the ex What I remember about the experience of watching it in theaters the first time was just how much I laughed, um, which I don't, I'm not really like an external reactor when I go to see movies. I'm very much just taking it all in and sitting silently. So for a movie to get me to laugh out loud as much as this did, um, I think it says a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much we could say about this movie. Um, I love Taika Waititi. I'm really excited to see what he does in the MCU and outside of the MCU um, in the future. Uh, and, I, you know, we've talked a lot about the curse of the third act in the MCU. And this is a movie that just completely nails it in the third act. Um, and I think you know, looking back on it, that is maybe one of the reasons why it just, it feels so much stronger than so many of the other films in, in the MCU. Yeah. I voted this for my number one and the rationale that I used when coming up with my list was if you ask me at any given moment to drop what I'm doing, like if, whether I'm working on a bike ride, like <laughs> what have you, like, and I have to watch one Marvel movie, right? It's not an option. I have to watch one Marvel movie this instant. Sounds like you are working. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to choose Thor Ragnarok a hundred times out of a hundred. Mm. It's the most fun I've ever had watching a Marvel movie. Um, I, I'm with you, Katie. I, I like howled through this entire movie. Like every single line landed with me. The Everything part with the snake boring. story. I just remember laughing so hard at that <laughs> part. <laughs> I think it's the funniest Marvel movie by far. And then at the end, you're right. Like the ending is phenomenal. The moment where, you know, Thor says, you're right. I can't, but he can like the creativity <laughs> behind, um, 
turning a loss into the ultimate win at the end Mm -hmm. is very very smart undercut a little bit by the beginning of infinity war like a month later (laughs) so sad (laughs) but if you uh if you view it in a vacuum like that it's wonderful um i mentioned previously that this one handily this was 34 more points than number two Um, and it's not, even though I feel like in hindsight, maybe our readers may have had the right of it with Endgame at one readers did have Thor Ragnarok at six. So like, this is by any metric, this is a top five Marvel movie objectively. I think, um, Mm -hmm. it's also kind of funny that we had Thor begin this list and Thor end this list. Ooh. Worst to first. (laughs) Gotta love a Cinderella story. (laughs) Ragnarok was such a breath of fresh air though, you know, um, I didn't know it would be the winner here, but I think it shows how much it changed the landscape of both the Thor franchise and notions of of how an MCU sequel needed to be or play out. It's just fun. There's really nothing to hate about it. Uh, Taika did a phenomenal job pulling this franchise back from the dead. Uh, as you know, we've said, Dark World is at the very bottom of this list. Um, but Taika's stamp, his sense of humour... It's all over it. And they just let Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston do what they do best through some great new characters into the mix. And all you could do is sit back and grin. Um, even if this wasn't my personal number one pick, I'm not mad to see it at number one. Like, not at all. I also appreciate that with Winter Soldier coming in at number two and this coming in at number one, they are kind of like the opposite ends of the greatness of the MCU spectrum. Like Winter Soldier is very much exactly what I want out of a more street level kind of gritty superhero type movie. Whereas Ragnarok is exactly what I want out of something a little more cosmic, a little more traditionally like comic booky. Um, you know, the MCU as a whole does not lean into like looking like comics, you know, which is kind of a shame considering that like the greatest comic book creator of all time, Jack Kirby created most of the characters that like appear in these movies. And there's very little in terms of Jack Kirby's bizarre design sense and scope and epic vision in these 27 movies, except for Ragnarok, which often looks like somebody took the most physically impossible, weird, what is this technology possibly supposed to do designs from a Jack Kirby panel and said, yeah, just just build that. Like, let's just build that. Like, let's put that on the wall, you know? And they did it and it's awesome. And it's so colorful. You know, a lot of these MCU movies have very muted color palettes. This looks like, Mike Hodges' Flash Gordon movie. Um, Like, it's great. It's, it's like, weirdly horny, too, which is also great. (laughs) Like, like, you know, because there's not enough of that. Like, like, that Andrew immediately puts (laughs) Tessa Thompson on screen. Like, like, that picture is a little intimidating. And also, you know, kind of hot. Like, so this is just... (laughs) Like that one too. Like, <laughs> like Andrew's movie, unhinged. He's drunk with power. <laughs> yeah, like this movie might be teaching people things about themselves. So I'm all for that. Like, <laughs> no, it's it, this is this is really masterful. Um, and I I'm so thrilled that Taika Waititi is back for a sequel. It feels like the Thor franchise, which once just kind of felt like the lesser of those initial core MCU things now is the one most poised for longevity. You know, if they announce tomorrow that they've already signed him to do a third movie and that really whatever the Thor trilogy is in the MCU is, is his vision. I'd be completely on board with that. Like, especially after, you know, the way they tied Thor in with the guardians of the galaxy and in infinity war and Endgame, like, this is good stuff. Um, I can't. I cannot wait for Love and Thunder, which is easily, easily my most anticipated MCU flick of the year, too. Good job, Thor. Yeah. <laughs> you did it, buddy. <laughs> Worst to first, you know. And and what did we say when we were talking about Dark World at number twenty-seven last week? We said, you know what? This is the worst movie on this list. <laughs> and like, it's still pretty good, right? Like that was like the baseline for the MCU is that it's still, you know, it's still watchable. It's perfectly entertaining. 
And then you go all the way to Thor Ragnarok, which is like visually inventive and weird and funny and like unexpected in ways that even a lot of the other movies higher on the high on this list do. So, yeah, I think uh, I think we got this one right. I'm pretty pleased with this. We, we did, did it. it. We did it. We actually <laughs> did it, and we ran long. <laughs> oh my god. This was an undertaking. Thank it you. Was. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I just want to rem remind everybody that this episode was sponsored by Plex, who are the current streaming home of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. You can watch Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man trilogy for free, presented by Crackle on Plex. Don't forget, Plex also has over 50,000 free on-demand titles and 200 live TV channels. So download the Plex app today, free on all your favorite devices to start watching. Tell them Den of Geek sent you because we want to keep making more episodes of Marvel Stand and we need more sponsors. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to Lee Parham for moderating our comments. Lee does all the social media work over on Den of Geek right now. Thank you to everybody for watching. We really appreciate this. This has been probably, these have been the two biggest episodes of Marvel Stand and we've ever done. We weren't sure we were going to be able to do these live, folks. So thank you so much. And don't forget, if you came in late, and you want to watch this from the beginning, it will be archived both here on Twitch and on our YouTube tomorrow. That's dennygeek.com slash, uh, I'm sorry, that is youtube.com <laughs> slash dennygeektube. We really need to change that. We're working on it. Uh, don't forget to follow our web home of dennygeek.com. We are at dennygeek on Twitter and at dennygeekus. You can also go directly to at dennygeek. I'm sorry, you can also go directly to at Marvel Standom on Twitter. Uh, and if you're tired of my face and who can blame you, you can also listen to Marvel Standom wherever you get your podcasts. So seriously, thank you all for coming on this journey with us. Thank you all for watching. And we'll be back next week. Stand together, folks. One of the biggest reactions I've ever heard in a movie theater is when I saw this film in a Cleveland suburb. And there's a scene where Zemo is going to visit um, some ex uh, Hydra agent. And the establishing shot is like the snowy hellscape that just looks like a backwater town in Siberia. And then the Chiron reads Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> 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 the entire theater erupts with laughter. <laughs>